In this video, we'll walk you through the basics of investment strategies for beginners. If you're overwhelmed with the investment terminology out there, this video is for you. So to start, what's an investment strategy? An investment strategy is a way of thinking that shapes how you select the investments in your portfolio. Now, the best strategies should help you meet your financial goals and then grow your wealth while maintaining a level of risk that lets you sleep at night. The strategy that you choose may influence everything from what types of assets you have to how you approach buying and selling those assets. If you're ready to start investing, a good rule of thumb is to ask yourself some basic questions. What are your goals? How much time until you retire? How comfortable are you with the risk? Do you know how much you want to invest in stocks, bonds, or an alternative? So this is where investment strategies come into play. Here are some key takeaways from this video before we get started. Number one, the best investment strategies balance the investor's risk tolerance while attempting to achieve the highest long-term return, risk and return. Number two, the strategy will vary depending on your end investment goal and its time frame, your risk tolerance, and how involved you want to be in choosing individual investments. Number three, many investors combine multiple strategies to find the most personalized strategy to fit their situation. There's no one size fits all strategy. So if you're not yet investing, there are some simple steps you can take to begin. If you have a 401k through your employer, make sure you're enrolled and investing at least enough of your salary to receive that company match. Then choose investments that are aligned with your goals. You should know that many 401ks offer relatively few investment choices. So the options for the strategy within those vehicles are usually limited. Another way to invest for retirement is to open an IRA through a brokerage account which will give you access to a more expansive world of investments than your 401k may offer. You can also trade through a brokerage account for long-term goals other than retirement. So let's get into active versus passive investing. First one, let's focus on active investing. So active investing, as its name implies, takes a hands-on approach and requires that someone act in the role of a portfolio manager. The goal of active money management is to beat the stock market's average returns and then take full advantage of short-term price fluctuations. It involves much deeper market analysis and the expertise to know when to pivot into or out of a particular stock, bond, or ETF. A portfolio manager usually oversees a team of analysts who look at qualitative and quantitative factors, then gaze into that crystal ball to determine where and when that price will change. Catching my drift here? Active investing requires confidence that whoever is investing in the portfolio will know exactly when the right time to buy or sell is. Successful active investment management requires being right more often than being wrong. That's what it comes down to. Active trading might include different strategies based upon pricing, such as swing or spread trading, for instance, and can also include momentum and event-driven strategies. Momentum investing seeks to identify and follow trends currently in favor to profit off of market sentiment. Event-driven investment strategies attempt to capture pricing differences during corporate changes and events, such as mergers and acquisitions, or a distressed company filing for bankruptcy, for example. Active investing is tough. YouTube is a great place to learn all the financial 101 lingo that we never learned in high school and college. I'm here to teach that. Hit subscribe and follow along. Passive investing, on the other hand, is an investment strategy designed to maximize returns by minimizing the buying and selling. Index investing is one common and probably the most common passive investment strategy, whereby investors purchase a representative benchmark fund and then hold it over a long time horizon. The prime example of a passive approach is to buy an index fund that follows one of the major indices like the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Whenever these indices switch up their constituents, the index funds that follow them automatically switch up their holdings by selling the stock that's leaving and buying the stock that's becoming part of the index. This is why it's such a big deal when a company becomes big enough to be included in one of the major indices. You know, it basically guarantees that the stock will become a core holding in thousands of major funds. Passive investing methods seek to avoid the trading fees and limited performance that may occur with active investing due to the high volume trading. You know, its goal is to simply build wealth gradually. It doesn't happen overnight. Also known as a buy and hold strategy, Passive investing means buying a security to own it long-term. And unlike active traders, passive investors do not seek to profit from short-term price fluctuations or market timing. The underlying assumption of passive investment strategy overall 
is that the market posts positive returns over time, over the long run. Just take a look at the S&P 500 index over the last 50 years, and it's really clear. The market, it goes up and to the right over the long run. Passive investing attempts to replicate market performance by constructing well-diversified portfolios of stocks or funds, which, if done individually, might require extensive research. Now, the introduction of index funds in the 1970s made achieving returns in line with the market much easier. It changed the game of investing. And in the 1990s, exchange-traded funds, or ETFs, that track major indices such as the Spider S&P 500 ETF, simplified the process even further by allowing investors to trade index funds as though they were stocks. All right, let's look at active versus passing now. Now, passive investing advantages. One, number one, ultra low fees. There's nobody picking stocks, so oversight is much less expensive. Passive funds simply follow the index that they use as their benchmark. Transparency. It's typically clear which assets are in an index fund. It's super transparent. Tax efficiency. Their buy and hold strategy does not typically result in massive capital gain taxes for the year. Now the passive investing disadvantages. It's more limited. Passive funds are limited to a specific index or predetermined set of investments with little to no variance from the benchmark. Some people might not like that. It can also lose money in the short term. Passive investing maximizes your returns over the long run, but that does not mean your returns in the short term will always be positive. Securities markets can, and often do, temporarily decline in value. And in many cases, they can be down for an extended amount of time. With passive investing, you have to hold on to your investments, whether they're up or whether they're down, with the hope that most of the major indices will be up over the long run. Remember that chart we looked at earlier? Think about that. Active investing advantages. Flexibility. Active managers are not required to follow a specific index. They can buy those diamond in the rough stocks that they believe they've found. Hedging. Active managers can also hedge their bets using various techniques such as short sales or put options. And they're able to exit specific stocks or sectors when the risks become too big or whenever they'd like. Now, active investing disadvantages. They can be very expensive. Thomson Reuters Lipper pegs the average expense ratio at 1.4% for an actively managed equity fund compared to only about 0.6% for the average passive equity fund. All those fees over decades of investing can kill returns. Active risk. Active managers are free to buy any investment, right? That they think would bring higher returns, which is great when the analysts are right, but terrible when they're wrong. Care to take a guess how often they're right versus wrong? You probably know the answer. So that leads into the passive versus active debate, right? You'd think a professional money manager's capabilities would trump a basic index fund. The reality is they don't. If you look at superficial performance results, passive investing works best for most investors. Study after study after study over decades shows that disappointing results for the active managers. Both of these strategies exist for a reason, and many investors might decide to blend these strategies. The data is clear though. A great example of that though is the hedge fund industry. Hedge fund managers are known for their intense sensitivity to the slightest changes in asset prices. Typically, hedge funds avoid mainstream investments, yet these same hedge fund managers actually invest a lot of their portfolios in passive index funds along with their active investments. Let's look at another strategy, dollar cost averaging. The biggest challenge to timing the markets is getting it right on a consistent basis. For those investors wary of trying their luck on market timing, but still wanting a good entry point into the market, the strategy of dollar cost averaging may appeal. So an investor who dollar cost averages their way into the market, they spread their investment purchases out over time, buying the same amount at regular intervals. You're basically setting up recurring automated deposits in this way. Doing so helps to smooth out the purchase price over time as you purchase more shares when the stock price is down and then you actually buy fewer shares when the stock price is up. Over time, you gain a better average entry price than if you were timing the market. And then you reduce the impact of market volatility on your portfolio as well. Growth investing. Growth investing involves buying shares of emerging companies that appear poised to grow at an above average pace in the future. Companies like this often offer a unique product or service that competitors cannot easily duplicate. While growth stocks are far from a sure thing, their allure is that they might grow in value much faster than established stocks if the underlying business takes off. 
growth investors are willing to pay a premium price for these stocks in exchange for their robust future growth potential. New technologies often fall into this category. For example, if someone believes that home buyers are going to shift increasingly from banks to online mortgage lenders with a streamlined application process, they might invest in the lender they believe will become dominant in that market. Investors can also look towards burgeoning geographies or companies to find growth. As they industrialize, emerging markets or developing economies usually are more volatile, but also grow at a faster pace compared to their more developed peers over the long term. Companies are valued by market capitalization, or market cap, which is calculated by their total outstanding shares available, times the market price of their shares. Small market cap stocks, shares of companies usually valued at $2 billion in market cap or less, provide investors with greater potential risk, but also greater potential return due to their faster growth trajectory. Value investing. Made famous by investors such as Warren Buffett, value investing is the bargain shopping of investment strategies. By purchasing what they believe to be undervalued stocks with strong long-term prospects, value investors aim to reap the rewards when the companies achieve their true potential in the years ahead. Value investing usually requires a pretty active hand someone who is willing to watch the market and the news for clues on which stocks are undervalued at any given time. Think about it like this. A value investor might scoop up shares of a historically successful car company when its stock price drops following the release of an awful new model, for example. So long as the investor feels that the new model was a fluke and that the company is gonna bounce back over time. Value investing is considered a contrarian strategy because investors are going against the grain or investing in stocks or sectors currently out of favor. A subset of investors take value by investing a step further, not just investing in cheaper stocks and sectors, but purposely seeking out the cheapest ones out there to invest in the so-called deep value. Income investing. Investment strategies can help investors produce a steady income stream, which many investors may use to cover their living expenses, especially when transitioning into retirement. The downside to this is that by spending the income instead of reinvesting it off of your investments, you don't get to take advantage of the powers of long-term compounding. To better understand compounding, check out the link in the description below. There are different investments that can produce income from dividend paying stocks and ETFs to bond and CD ladders to real estate. For younger investors, unless you absolutely need the extra income, you might consider reinvesting all of that income that you earn on your investments to take advantage of the power of compounding. Socially responsible investing. Social issues such as climate change and racial justice impact lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So SRI, socially responsible investing, aims to create positive change in society while also generating positive returns. In addition to investment performance, SRI investors look into a company's business practices and revenue sources to ensure that they're actually aligned with their personal values. Some investors employ SRI by excluding company stocks that go against their moral compass. For instance, they might exclude investments in sin stocks or tobacco and alcohol-related companies as well. Others intentionally direct their investment dollars towards issues that they care about, such as renewable energy companies. Now, there are SRI ETFs that exclude businesses involved in civilian firearms, controversial weapons, tobacco, thermal coal, and oil sands, and include higher portions of companies that score well for the ESG, Environmental, Social, and Governance Rate. If you want to grow your wealth through investing while also doing good, this strategy might be right for you. Ready to get started investing? I'm Tony from Wealthfront. Take care.